Okay, again, talking about the blessings and responsibilities of being a Christian, and the, the writer begins by simply noting uh, that every one of us have big events that happen in our lives, uh, the mention of birth, graduation, marriage, death, but, uh, but points out the fact that the first and greatest of all of these events is our conversion to Christ. Uh, it impacts the very life that we live, it impacts our relationship with God, it impacts our hope of eternity, and, um, and there are many, many people in the world today uh, that never experience that and don't have that proper appreciation. More problematic for us tonight as we study together is it can be possible for Christians to lose that appreciation. Uh, one of the things that I, I constantly am, am aware of and note is the, is the uh, zeal that the Apostle Paul felt in his proclamation of the gospel, the ministry, and the life that he lived for the Lord, primarily uh, not only because of his own character and who he was, because I think that was evident even when he was a persecutor of the, the church, his zeal was great, but also because of the great gift that he had been given by God. Uh, that is why in, in Romans chapter 1 and verse 15, he called himself a debtor to others. He owed a debt to other people. And that was the feeling that he had, not because they had done anything for him, but God had done so much for him. And he felt it was his responsibility to share that with others, and so he was very, very strong in his, in his appreciation, very, very strong in his desire to maintain his, his uh, full commitment to the Lord. But you see that there are others in the New Testament, uh, individuals who uh, lost their first love, as the church in Ephesus had done, Demas, who forsook Paul in his ministry, having loved the present world, uh, the church in Laodicea that was described as being lukewarm, and we could give other examples of the very same thing. So it's important that we personally grasp uh, the importance of what God has done for us and strive uh, to consider that and to recognize that as the most important thing that actually happens in our lives. There are plenty of passages which teach that that is the case. It talks about the superlative nature of, um, of eternal salvation. It talks about the significance of, um, of turning yourself over to Christ. It talks about the, the great joy that we receive as a result of what we will obtain. It talks about the value of the soul. All of those kinds of things indicate very clearly but the biggest event in anyone's life is becoming a Christian. As Ecclesiastes 12 says, it is man's purpose. It is man's all to serve him. So this lesson, he says in point number three of the introduction, is the first in a series. The first lesson was primarily just a, an introductory idea of whether you are a disciple or not. But this is the first designed to encourage and instruct us to have a closer walk with God, to be more fruitful. So as we mentioned, as we studied uh, last week and as we began our discussion together, our emphasis is going to be on trying to be more zealous and to be more appreciative and be more aware of what God has granted us, lest we fall into some of those same ruts that we have seen some mentioned in the, in the first century in Scripture. And also we can kind of evidence or see evidentially an, an anecdotal uh, evidence that we supply uh, or we receive uh, in our time as well. You just look and you see people who are not, really are not on fire for the Lord as they ought to be. So we want to be motivated to fulfill the goal of having a closer walk with God. And he says here to help motivate that, we've got a few points uh, of the blessings that comes as a result of our standing with God. The first one is that familial relationship mentioned here in point one that we have God as our Heavenly Father. Uh, he was referred to any number of times in Scripture, including there in 1 John 3 and verse 1, of a Father to us, uh, expressing the concept of love and family relationship, uh, that it is right and proper for us to be called children of God. Now understand this, that you have individuals who will talk about that because God created us, in a sense we are children of God. And I suppose that is true in one sense, but not in the sense that the Bible uh, uses the phrase children of God. In that sense, it is an exclusive um, relationship that not all enjoy. We are all God's creation. We are not all God's children. So the, uh, the Jewish nation, originally God's chosen people, they were 
uh, the ones who had that relationship with God. And now, uh, as a result of being in Christ, we have it as well. We have that, that relationship, which, if you'll note, uh, being called children of God, uh, there are a couple of things that are noted in, in the first four points concerning that blessing of having God as our Father that are true. Uh, we are told in James 1.17, that every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. So the first point is that God gifts us things and good things. He is the source of every good and every perfect gift. And as fathers and children use that relationship as parents and children, uh, he provides us comfort in our afflictions. We will be afflicted, but we receive comfort from God. Uh, he... Uh, chastises us as Hebrews chapter 2 and that full text in verses 5 through 11 if you'll, if you'll note that text actually verses 5 and 11 with nothing in between as far as spending uh, saving some time verse 5 you have forgotten the exhortation which spoke to his sons my son do not despise the chastening of the Lord uh, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him and then in verse 6 for the Lord whom he loves and chastens and scourges every son who he receives. So let's, again, as we attribute that to our own uh, families, we understand that parents from, some, from time to time chastise their children. There is a purpose for that. Verse 11, we are told no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. But afterwards it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. And so it's not necessarily a joyous thing, but it is something that we should rejoice in or be happy about because it indicates the Father's love to us and it also indicates the good blessings and benefits that, that we receive as a result of that chastening. Parents do it with children. They don't always do it right. They don't always use the right judgment. They aren't always correct in what they're doing but their purpose, ostensibly if they're good fathers or good mothers, their purpose is to grow their child, to limit their child in ways in which he should or she should not go. And that's why the chastening is necessary. And the same thing is true with God, except for the fact that God is perfect with regard to that chastisement. But then the final point, he has promised never to forsake us. And, um, and so Hebrews 13 and, and verse 5 tells us that. He himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we say, the Lord is my helper. What can man do to me? And uh, we've read many times from Romans chapter 8. Uh, that point that if God is with us, He can be against us. And if the God uh, of heaven is on our side, then uh, we cannot be overcome, we cannot be defeated. Um, and that's a wonderful, wonderful blessing that we have. I, I should probably state that a bit differently. We cannot be defeated. We will not be defeated if we do our part, if God is with us. Uh, we cannot be defeated. The devil cannot defeat us. Men cannot defeat us. Life, death, principalities, powers, things present, things to come, height, depth, any other created thing. Nothing, nothing can separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. And so as a result of that, those are the blessings that we have. So with that in mind, those four quick points there under 1A, uh, does anyone have any questions or anything that you want to add to those Four things. What constitutes uh, the blessing of having God as our Father? All right, then uh, we don't want to give short shrift to that because, of course, the purpose of this is for us to rejoice in it. But uh, as was noted with the uh, Apostle Paul, uh, we talked about this in our study last week that uh, that Paul, in preaching the gospel, he did not have a reward in the sense that. Uh, that it was not something he was doing for himself or to gain something. He was a steward and he was only doing it because as a servant it was required of him. And we need to understand to a certain extent the same thing. Great blessings, great value comes as a result of our relationship with God, but each and every one of us have a resulting obligation. If God has done this for us, then this is a particular way that God expects us to act. And if we don't do that, there are a couple of things that we need to keep in mind. First of all, uh, we are being um, selfish and, and, and not being thankful uh, for, for what we have received. And there are a lot of people who are that way. Uh, they'll receive, they'll receive, it may be that they're spoiled, it may be it's expected, it may be they don't have a full understanding. Uh, so it doesn't matter if it's your parents, if it's society, if it's uh, 
uh, if it's the Lord in regard to the church, they will receive and, and be insensitive to their need to express gratitude. So be ungrateful for what they have received. The second um, indication with regard to this is some individuals, it's not just that they are ungrateful, uh, but they are just, um, they're just rebellious. They're just, uh, um, or, or lacking in, in, in the, the devotion and the dedication because they don't have an understanding of the significance of these things. Um, I, I really, and although I know that there are some people who think, who realize how great it is and don't appreciate it anyway, it's hard for me to imagine someone like that. You know exactly how it is that God has sent His Son. He loved the world so much. He loved us first. We love Him because He first loved us. He sent His Son to die on the cross. This is how great a sacrifice Jesus suffered on our behalf. We are all guilty. We're all responsible. We'd go to hell if it wasn't for what Jesus has done for us. And yet, I don't care. I want to live my own life. That kind of insensitivity, that kind of rebelliousness is something that's hard to fathom. And uh, it's something we need to be recognizing. Ultimately, it's what it ends up being. If, if we're ungrateful, if we're insensitive, if we're just lukewarm with regard to it, we're not doing any better than the individual who, who basically says, I just won't. Uh, do you remember the parable of the prodigal son who said, I won't, and went out and... Uh, oh, no, not prodigal son. I'm thinking of another one. I'm thinking of one, the, 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 the servant, I mean, the son of the fa father who father said to do it, and he said, I won't do it. And then he repented and did. <laughs> and the other one said, I will, and it turned out he didn't. You know, it's, it's kind of that that, that we're, we're talking about. It doesn't matter what your initial uh, indication is. It's whether you actually uh, work for the Lord. And so there are some responsibilities that are mentioned in points one and two of letter B. Any comments? All right, then let us get to uh, letter B. And there are responsibilities for having God as our Father. And the first is submission as indicated there in James chapter 4, and verse 7, which basically says that. Submit to God and resist the devil, and he will flee from you. So submission to God. First of all, we note, um, uh, again, as our Father, we, we can look at the parallel, we can look at the, uh, uh, the metaphor and examine it uh, in light of our own experiences and the fact that, that obedience to our Father was both expected and, uh, and appropriate for us because of the relationship we sustained. Uh, but we do have to note, as is made it noted in, in, uh, in the, the, the first letter, A, the way in which we submit to God, is Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Uh, it's not submission to God to serve God the way you want to serve him. Again, that's, aren't these easy things to know? Uh, your father tells you to do something, you do something entirely different, and when you can't question you, you say, well, I thought this was a better way to do, do what you want me to do, or a better way of, of obeying you. And, and the answer is, why didn't you do what I told you to do instead of what you wanted to do? And, uh, and, that's, and that's kind of what we're talking about here. God has imperfection, in fulfillment, or in, uh, in, in full amount, the full, full part. Um, he has told us what he wants us to do, what he expects of us under this new covenant in order to please him. We don't have any vagaries here. We don't have any... Um, lack of surety as to what God expects, he's revealed it through his will. We can't know the mind of God unless, unless God reveals it to us. And the way he's chosen to reveal it is through, through his word. And so if we want to submit to God, we have to submit to his word. It's, a, it's an objective thing and it is also uh, an object, a reality that the way in which we determine if we're pleasing him is objective as well. Um, I, I've, I've I've heard this so many, many, many times and, and a number of times recently where individuals will talk about a relationship that either they or someone else has sustained with God and I just know it. And when you examine the evidence that is found in that person's life, you'll find that they're not living up to what God has said they should do. They're doing things that violate what he said not to do. They're doing things that violate and don't do what he said to do, and, and yet they say, but I know that I've got a right relationship with God. I know that I'm obedient to him. I know that I'm serving him. And it's very subjective, rather than being the objective thing that's needed. Yes, John? Because, I mean, you know, I know God is wanting me happy, so, you Same type of thing, yeah. So they always say, right? Yeah, sure. And, 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 and again, not only is it a subjective thing when that kind of thing is said, so let's use that, that example. Uh, you show them something found in Scripture, but I know God wants me to be happy. Okay, so, so number one, um, it's not true 
in, in the sense that what God wants you is to be safe for eternity, which of course is where true happiness and joy comes. But, uh, but there are many people who suffer while on this earth, uh, faithful people who suffer while on this earth, which proves that's not so. But the second thing is this knowing is based upon not what God's Word says, but some feeling that they had, some tradition that they followed, some relationship that in their mind they have started with God. It has to be something that is subjective because it emanates not from God, it emanates from them. I have a relationship with God. And so I suppose it could be said in a sense that you feel close to God, and so you feel yourself to have a relationship. This is two-way street. And uh, perhaps the question that most of us should ask is, does God have a relationship with us? And, uh, and he only does so if we are indeed submitting to his word. And so by submitting to his word and submitting to his providential workings in our lives, that's kind of an interesting point that is made. It's taken from 1 Peter chapter 5. Verse 6 tells us, to humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you. And in verse 11, to him be the glory and the dominion forever. And so what we have to understand and recognize is that God has that purpose for us. And sometimes to fight against that would be kind of like Jonah deciding to go the opposite way of Nineveh uh, because he doesn't want to, to do what God wants him to do instead of accepting those things. All right, so uh, that's point one. All right, point number two is we must also draw near to God, which is the second part of James chapter 4. This time uh, it is verse 8 of the text, if we draw near to God. So let's start back with verse 7. Submit to God, resist the devil, he will flee from you. Draw near to God, he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, purify your hearts, you double-minded. So it is not only that we submit to God, but we draw near to God. Now, I'll just uh, point out the fact that sometimes... Um, some people have or can have um, a skewed view of their relationship with God. So they expect um, God to be uh, their Lord, God to be the one who has all authority, the one that, that God tells them to do, but they, they think of it almost autocratically, uh, that, that he is a, a man who uh, has no real care for us, he has no concern for us, it's just something... He demands of us what the God in heaven demands I do. And so they don't feel the relationship that they need to. Now, I will state uh, as we begin that uh, to make this point that, uh, that more people probably think of the relationship rather than the lordship. But perhaps this is something you may have struggled with in the past or have seen others who have struggled with it. You know what you need to do, but you really don't feel anything. And I think that's what happened with Ephesus when they lost their first love. They were going through the the ritual of serving God. There is not an indication there in Ephesus that they were doing anything that was particularly wrong, but it seems like that they were going through the motions somewhat. And he called them to repent. We were told that we have to worship in spirit and in truth. So it's not enough simply to go through the motions. We have to have something that, uh, that binds us. And, uh, and so this is an important point to be made, to draw near to God. So with that in mind, just give me a, a, an answer to this question. How is it that we can, or what are some things that we can do uh, to draw near to God? How, how can we handle this? Yeah. Well, the only way to know what God wants us to do is read His Word. So if we can't, as Christians, we should be reading His Word every day. Even if you have five minutes, and a lot of times it will go longer than we can't read his word every day and we're not going to know what he wants and we're not going to go to him. That's the way we can go to him by reading his word every day, studying um, every day. Okay. That's a very good point. And, um, and I think that it is a very um, practical thing to indicate how to draw near to God. But we do read it devotionally. We don't, I mean, let's say with devotion. Uh, it's not just a devotional book. But we read it with devotion. We read them merely as that. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to draw near to the Constitution of the United States by simply reading what it says and how it impacts my life. Uh, but if I have a love for God, if I have a love for, um, for his, his, uh, his son and, and those kinds of things, by reading what he requires for me, 
then it's going to help me draw near. And that, that, that I think becomes very evident uh, as you read, for example, the 119th Psalm. If you haven't made a practice of reading that, it's a wonderful passage of Scripture because the psalmist talks about how much delight he has in the law of the Lord and how uh, he strives to embrace the, the qualities that are found in Scripture and the, and the requirements of God in those things. What else besides reading would be something that we can do? Wouldn't meditation be tied into that as well? Uh, because then it, it, it basically enlivens it in our lives. It makes it uh, become more of us, a more part of us. We don't just read it. We read it for the purpose of applying and growing and of growing closer to God. Um, prayer, uh, singing. Uh, that's one of the things that I, I note when we're, whenever we have our, our singing classes, our fifth Sunday singings, our fourth our fifth Wednesday singings, our fourth Sunday singings. And it's been that way, not only here, but in every congregation I've been a part of since growing up. Not everyone comes to those. And, uh, and they think, well, I'm not a good singer, or I'm not going to help, or we're not being taught, so it's not as important. It just doesn't make much sense to me because some of the times in which I have drawn closest to God is being touched by the sentiments and the, and the, uh, uh, the melody and, and other aspects of singing. It's just a, an important thing. It allows us to rejoice as we give praise to Him. So there are a lot of things that we can do, and we'll talk about that in uh, the next lesson when we talk about the public assembly. Um, we could even say drawing near to God with regard to how we can do that. One of the ways is by observing the death of his son on the first day of the week. If you don't take the time when um, we come together, the men decided to do this about a month, uh, month ago, to, uh, to start off the Lord's Supper each Sunday with about 10, 15, 20 seconds worth of silent um, gathering of thoughts and preparation. Uh, if you're not taking advantage of that, if you are not remembering the Lord's death, if you're not, if you're not uh, taking heed how you partake of the supper, uh, you're missing out. I'm not just going to say you're eating uh, damnation, eating and drinking damnation to yourself, not discerning the Lord's body, but there is that second thing, an important thing, is you're missing out on an opportunity to draw ever closer and, and be more devoted to the Lord as a result of it. Well, and we have to make God a part of our life every day, not just on Sunday when those special you know, when we have the things we do, or Wednesday, but And that's where the prayer comes in as well, because you spend time each day with God and His Word and reading those kinds of things. Draw me. Yes. Yes. The way is to consciously rely on God. Um, you can talk to God about it in prayer and things like that, but, but the thing that helps you draw near to Him in that is that it's like the passages in there. Jesus is saying, hey, I wanted to gather you guys like a hen gathers the chicks, right? I wanted to protect you. I wanted to nurture you. I wanted you to be in a way. Well, well, why didn't he? Because they weren't receptive to him. But then being, being consciously reliant on God is not unlike being consciously reliant on your earthly parents. It's a, it's a question of humbling yourself. And it's a question of accepting love. And that strengthens your bond with your earthly parents when you do that. And it strengthens your bond with your Heavenly Father when you do that. That's a good point. And my add to that, when you use that as an illustration, we, we typically can see, let's say using real parents, with real parents, physical parents, with, uh, human parents with human children, and how that is the children grow up, they will have a tendency, not always, and sometimes it's the parents' fault as well, but there will be the tendency as they grow and become more independent that they'll, they'll, they'll be with their parents less and depend on their parents less and they, it can cause problems in the relationship and, and, and move away. Um, so, so there are those kinds of things that come um, and, and so the same thing can be true as we grow old as Christians, that as we become uh, not, not more mature per se because maturation would never bring that, but as we become more um, 
I suppose um, uh, there's a word that I'm familiar familiar with with uh, our relationship and, and those things. And as we as we are encumbered by duties, as we as we uh, strive to do what's right and all, then then it can be more become ourselves and what we're doing rather than depending upon God to help us in those things as well. And maybe that has something to do with what happened with Ephesus as well. But, uh, but that's an important point to play. It, it, has to, it has to be in every part of our life. And, and uh, God's waiting for us uh, to, to draw near to Him. We have to work at it and depend on it. Okay, the second point, because there are three, of course, that have reference to the, the actual four, or four points with regard to blessings. The first three have to do with Godhead. The second is Jesus Christ as our Lord and High Priest. We're told there is one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we for him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we live. That's 1 Corinthians 8. And Hebrews chapter 4 tells us we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God. And with that, let us hold fast to our confession. So this is the relationship we have. And you'll note again, the point, quick points will be made with regard to the blessings themselves. Uh, since he is our Lord, he is the ruler over all the earth. And so, in effect, uh, the one who has all authority, as indicated again in Romans chapter 8, is with us. Uh, he has all authority in heaven and earth. All have been made subject to him, as 1 Peter 3 tells us. And yet, you'll notice in Hebrews chapter 2 and verses 11 and 12, he says, I will declare your name to my brethren in the midst of the assembly. I will sing praise for you. Jesus is not ashamed to call us brethren. And that's a wonderful, wonderful thing because as we talked about earlier, God has created all men. Jesus Christ gave himself and died for all men, but there are only uh, a few uh, of whom he will call brethren because he is the only begotten of the Father. We are adopted children, so we are joint heirs together with him as a result of his sacrifice on the cross. And he's not ashamed to make known that that is the case. So much better, so much greater, so much more importance, and yet we have that relationship as, as his brethren, and that is such a wonderful thing uh, that we enjoy as a result of him. So those are the, the important things to note with regard to point one. Point two is that the, the office of high priest, as it was defined in the Old Testament, had reference to a man who was chosen, uh, whose responsibility was to make intercession on behalf of the people, you'll remember that once a year on the, uh, the Day of Atonement, he would go in and he would purify himself. He would offer up a sin sacrifice for the entirety of the nation, including he himself. But a contrast is made uh, with regard to Jesus Christ as our high priest uh, because he died once for all, but he did not have to purify himself. He purified the rest of us, sanctified us through, uh, through his shed blood. And the thing that makes that Important is because the one once for all necessity of it because his, his blood was sufficient. But also as indicated in these two points, he knows, he understands, he was tempted in all points like as we are, uh, as we were and are. So as a result of that, when he makes an intercession on our behalf, when he pleads to God on our behalf, he has that sympathy. Though he himself has not sinned, he has been tempted to sin like we have. And he understands every feeling that we have because he served or came to this earth as a man. And so he serves as the perfect go-between. Uh, he is greater than we are, and yet he has elements of humanity that he has experienced in coming in the form of man. And so he has the right to present us before God and to intercede on our behalf. And then the second thing that is mentioned here, and it's related, uh, alluded to in Hebrews chapter 4, 7 and verse 24, uh, he is able to save those who come to God through him since he always lives. So as an intercessor, he does not die. Uh, he died on the cross, shed his blood, ascended, was resurrected from the dead, ascended into heaven. He's at the right hand of the Father. He will always be at the Father's right hand. The entirety of the time that any of us need us until the end of the time, end of time, till he comes again, he will always be alive always interceding for the Christian's behalf, always pleading and helping us so that we have that ability to be reconciled to God. We wouldn't have it without Jesus, but because of Jesus we do. So those are the blessings. I'm not sure if I explained that as clearly as I could or as well as I could, but that's the primary two points that are made there. Comments, questions before we go on to the responsibilities as a result of Christ. 
I know that I'm going through this fairly rapidly, but we're already running out of time. Uh, the responsibilities, number one, if he is truly our Lord, we have to do what he says. I've preached on this many, many times. The word Lord Curios indicates one who has all authority. He stated himself in Matthew 28 in verses 18 through 22 that he has all authority in heaven and on earth and it is our responsibility to do what he tells us to do. You can say, there are many people who will say he is my Savior and by that they mean that it's because of him that I have the hope of salvation or maybe even they think that it's because of him that I do have salvation yet they don't accept his lordship. They don't accept his rule over their lives. And if he's not your Lord, then he's not your Savior. And that's something to keep in mind. And secondly, we utilize his role as our high priest by prayer. Hebrews chapter 4, we have the great high priest who has passed through the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. We do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. Was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin. Let us therefore... Come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find help in time of need. And so because he is our intercessor, we have the ability always and we ought to take advantage of it. Uh, when we look at 1 John chapter 1, we indicate that those who are living for Christ um, are walking in the light. We have fellowship with God, but they're in that context that tells us that if we confess, if we confess, uh, then, then God is just to forgive us of our sins. And the reason for that is because the high priest is there interceding on our behalf. And he always has, always will, and it's a blessing that we receive as Christians because of it. All right? Questions, comments? Okay, now to the... Res uh, no, that's... that's uh, yeah, that's the responsibility. So now let's go to the third point. And this third point, it's going to take me a little bit... I just want to make a couple of points along this. The Holy Spirit who dwells in us. Now... Um, the phrase who dwells in us does not give me any cause to concern myself because the scripture very clearly says that the Holy Spirit dwells in us. However, I do know um, that there are many brethren, and I think this preacher is one of them. I think, in fact, I think he's made it clear in certainly things that he's written. Uh, believes in what is referred to as a personal dwelling, a bodily dwelling of the Holy Spirit within each Christian. And from that indicates that as, as we are told we are the temple of the Holy Spirit that what that indicates is the Holy Spirit literally is dwelling in us. And there are many preachers, many scholars, many individuals outside of the denominations who do not believe that that's what is indicated by the phrase the dwelling of the Holy Spirit uh, or the Spirit dwelling in us in the sense they believe that it dwells in us, He dwells in us metaphorically in the sense of the Word. It is referring instead to a relationship. And the work that the Holy Spirit does is not something that is subjective or not something that is um, indecipherable, not something that is um, we are incapable of measuring or knowing, but rather it is something that is abundantly revealed to us in the Word of God, and we find it through the revelation. So there are those differences. I just want to make note of them as we get into this text, lest there be any uh, misconceptions or misunderstanding. Um, one point that, um, that Brother Mike Willis in his, in his commentary on this particular thing uh, made that it's, it's, it's very interesting. Uh, and I just want to read it very quickly so that you'll kind of get where the, the difference occurs. He said, Sometimes brethren see only a literal meaning to some of these passages. It should be helpful to look at several uses of phrases which mention the idea of indwelling or being in another and consider the other uses of the same kind of phraseology. So when we say that the Spirit dwells in us, we are not saying anything different from when we say, for example, that God dwells in us. And so the same phrase is used with regard to the Father as is used with regard to the Holy Spirit. So there are a number of places where this is taught. For example, in 1 John and uh, chapter 4 and verses 12 uh, through 15, I'll, I'll preach it in quote, uh, whoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwells in him and he in God. Now, I want you to understand the significance of that phrase, simply that God dwells in us and we dwell in God. And we understand that that does not have a relationship that is, uh, that is a physical dwelling within our bodies, nor do we think that we physically dwell inside of God. It has reference to the relationship that we sustain. Uh, also, 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 16, where God said, 
uh, as you are the temple of the living God, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And again, we understand that to be a relationship. Uh, and so uh, the same thing is true with regard to references to Christ indwelling the Christian. Notice Romans chapter 8 and verse 10, If Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. If Christ be in you. Uh, 1 John chapter 3 and, and verse 23, um, this is the commandment that we should believe on the name of the Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave his commandment. He that keeps his commandments dwells in him and he in him. Hereby we know that he abides in us by the Spirit which he has given us. And so again, this has reference to an indwelling or a dwelling in with regard to both um, the Father and the Christ as well as the Holy Spirit. Now, I do not deny that the Father dwells in us. I do not deny that Jesus dwells in us. I do not deny that we dwell in Jesus or that we dwell in the Father because First John 3 tells us uh, we know that God abides in us uh, in verse 24 and also in First John chapter 4, whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwells in him and he in God. And so just understand that uh, I'm not going to try to dispute it particularly but that there are two ways of, of looking at this, this particular point rather than just the one that is found in this particular set of, of, uh, of points to be made. If you have any more interest in reading it, uh, about it, there is a, uh, an article called The Spirit's Intercession that was written by Dennis Abernathy uh, that you can access on the, uh, on the, the truthmagazine.com website. And if you'd like that, I'll give you are when I have an opportunity. So with that in mind, just keep it in mind uh, as to what, whether it is indwelling us personally or indwelling in us uh, through the Word as there are differences. We do know that the work that the Holy Spirit gives to us is through the Word. Uh, that's the work that God has given. Remember when Jesus in John chapter 16 indicated he would send the Holy Spirit who would guide them into all truth. First, uh, Second Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16 and 17 that, the, that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Uh, the Holy Spirit, as, as Peter tells us, spoke, or that holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And so there are wonderful blessings that are attributed. Uh, whether it, and, and again, I don't want to be in any way objective with regard to this. I will state clearly that while I think I've got a relationship with the Spirit and, um, and, uh, and the closeness of that and, and I, I embrace what has been given, there has never been a time when I felt something happening to me as a result of the physical indwelling uh, in my life, uh, never separate and apart from God's Word and His instructions to me. And, uh, and I do think that uh, Brother Copeland says something a little bit different in the way he puts the point. I don't have issue with the passages in Romans 8 and verses 11, Ephesians 3 and verse 16, the giving us strength to put death to fleshly deeds of the body. That is accomplished through God's Word, uh, I believe, rather than simply that once I become a Christian, all of a sudden I have more ability to, to resist the devil than what I had before. The only reason that comes is because, as we've talked so much, is about the Word, about adding the fruit of the Spirit, of, of, uh, of taking issue with the lust of the flesh, and so on and so forth. And also the second point that is made here, uh, and that is um, he helps us in our weakness when it comes to praying as we ought back against the intercession. That, word intercessor, while it is indeed appropriate, it's not the same as Christ as our intercessor. So, making that point with regard to the blessings of the Holy Spirit very quickly, because we're almost out of time, we mentioned the responsibilities that we have in view of the Spirit's indwelling. Keep ourselves holy, as we are told in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. We're to glorify God with our bodies, and that is what we do. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, walk in the Spirit, as Galatians chapter 5 tells us, rather than keeping the lust of the flesh. We do that by setting our minds on the things of the Spirit, which are the things that are revealed to us, involving the Word of God, which is the sword of the Spirit, as indicated in Ephesians chapter 6. I knew we wouldn't quite get through all this unless we rush, so uh, we've got about five minutes, and we'll get blessed in that. So let's just very quickly go to the church as our family. Uh, we are told, of course, uh, in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3, that we ought to conduct ourselves appropriately in the house of God, which is the pillar of uh, the church of God, uh, uh, which is the pillar and ground of truth. And so there is that call for us uh, to have or that recognition that as we 
look at one another. It's not just a, an individual relationship that we sustain with God. It is inclusive of all Christians, if it's used in that more universal sense, or if we were to be talking about it here at West Side of, of reference to those who are in the church. Uh, just to know the men have come up with a, an idea. Actually, we're not the ones that came up with it. I think it was Ellen Davis and Rachel uh, Cox that were talking about it. But the idea of the personal work groups and we're going to reconstitute them a little bit in the first of the year just to fill in with the ones we've lost, make sure they've got base uh, and all. But to spend some time with, your, with that group of meeting together with them maybe once a month for six months or something like that in someone's home, getting to know each other better expressing that love and showing that concern for one another and looking out for one another a bit better. I think that's important and it's a good idea because the church is indeed a family. The members become like fathers, mothers, brothers, and sisters. And even we are told that sometimes becoming a child of God causes us to lose our family. But we grow closer to Christians as a result of the relationship that we sustain. Second, letter B, the responsibilities of having the church as our family were to edify one another. Hebrews 10 very clearly teaches that, which is why we are to assemble, that we may edify one another, and so much the more as we see the day approaching, and uh, we each do our share as found in Ephesians 4. But also as Galatians chapter 6 and verses 1 and 2, it says, Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you be tempted, bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the love of Christ. And so that's an important consideration as well. All right. We're going to draw to a close. Got a minute or two left is all. But does anyone have anything they want to add to this? Any questions or comments uh, with regard to either of those final few points that I covered very, very rapidly? All right. Then when we look at the conclusion, it says there are certainly many other blessings and responsibilities that we have as a Christian. That is certainly the case. But they're all bound up. You'll remember in Ephesians chapter 1, you're told that all the spiritual blessings in the heavenly places come through Jesus Christ. And so when we talk about blessings, uh, it all relates to the relationship we sustain with Christ as part of that new covenant. But that leads us to have certain responsibilities. If anyone tells you, comes up to you and says, I've been saved by Christ, He is my Savior, I've expressed my love or my trust in His finished work, and therefore, I don't have to do anything else, or I'm in a good state even though I'm not living the way I should, but I'm going to heaven anyway. It doesn't work that way. The Bible doesn't reveal it to be the case. And so what we need to understand is how important it is for us as individuals to do what's right, but also, as we've talked about, to be zealous for good works, to strive to love and, and serve Him. And we're blessed so much for what we receive as Christians. We ought to show up before we with our lives. All right? Appreciate very much everyone's kind attention today, and we'll pick up with lesson number three. Again, I apologize that we're having to go so fast, but uh, he puts a lot of more scriptures in there than what I would have uh, to illustrate each sub point. Uh, and so, 